the Ogwen Valley in Snowdonia, low-flying territory. If the pilot is on course, then in five seconds' time, a Hawk T Mark I will fly through it at seven miles a minute. the pilots we've been following through their fast jet training at RAF Valley on Anglesey, three are now just six flights away from finishing the crucial first stage, 208 Squadron. But these last flights will be the toughest yet. On April the 9th, 2003, the statue of Saddam Hussein is pulled down in Baghdad. In other parts of the city, there were images of joy and gratitude. But today, Dave McBride has no time for world events. Dave is taking his final navigation test. Are you equipped for it? Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, definitely ready, definitely ready. But it's one of those things, it's a test. There's all sorts of things that could go wrong on the day of a test. Um, so it's never a given, yeah. um, apart from the, the odd sky god that comes through that does it without thinking about it, and there are not many of those around. Dave has been given three map line. references in Wales. He now has three hours to find and identify the targets, plan an effective route of attack, brief his examiner and get airborne. Unless there's a building. The first target is easy, a building perched on the side of a hill near Ludlow. The second target is a very small lake and in the middle of that lake is a feature. And he's got to do a recce on that and find out what that feature is. And the last one is the bridge. Uh, which is difficult to attack from any direction. A bit of extra pressure, which some days benefits me, other days it doesn't. The politics of war demands enormous skill from today's pilots. Precision low flying is an essential skill in reducing collateral damage. It's a very topical thing at the moment with the war going on and the accuracy of our weapons, uh, but it's also the accuracy of the guy who's flying the airplane and his decision-making process. And I think, yes, yeah, it's, it's essential training. With 18 years' experience already in the RAF, low-level flying is nothing new to Dave McBride. But those years were spent as a navigator, not a pilot. The next hour will be a severe test of Dave's skill at the controls. And his examiner will be in the back, watching every move. The first task is to find the building on the side of the hill. It's a small white farmhouse. But his second task, Dave must fly over a lake and identify the target. It's a small island. The last target is the most difficult. Dave has to find a bridge at the bottom of a narrow valley. Gate located, Dave heads for home.
Let's go. My grin. My grin is because I've just passed another big test. We did it. So uh, he's uh, let me into the secret. Fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Time to get changed because I am soaking under here. <laughs> and you don't want that on film, I can tell you. <laughs> Dave is now one step closer to finishing the course. It's not been any harder than I expected, but it's been harder than I hoped, personally. Uh, I was hoping I was going to ace it, but I haven't. I've just been like everybody else, had to work damn hard to actually get this far. Uh, and we're nine trips to go. Most of us are close to the end of this phase. Hey, you getting it, mate? Hey, congratulations. Sweet, mate. Sweet, mate, mate. Dave can now move his marker on the pilot's unofficial course board. We're in. He and the other pilots have passed the navigation hurdle. It's been a gruelling six months, but they're now just two weeks away from the last test on 208 Squadron. There's over 5,000 hours of low-level flying in Wales every year. For those on the ground, low flying can be a source of fascination or a nuisance. I don't know how many of them actually stopped thinking, oh, I wonder what he's been doing for the last two minutes. The fact that he was 20 miles away three minutes ago and he's going to be 20 miles you know, further that way in another three minutes. And as far as they're concerned, it, oh, it's great. You must be sat in there looking out the window, beautiful day, flying low level, great fun. How can that be stressful? Occasionally when you're working really hard, you're thinking, well, this, this isn't any fun at all. You know, I'm really under pressure here and it's not going well. You've got to pass the trip because if you don't, then you're not going to succeed and, and nobody wants to fail. You think about your next turning point, you think about how your fuel's going, are you going to be able to get to the next, uh, the next target? It doesn't take much of a mistake to fly into the ground. What's the weather like for pulling up? Who are you going to talk to when you pull up? Um, you know, you've got controlled airspace. You've got huge numbers of things that you're always thinking about. And so it, it just focuses your mind as to what you're doing, because it is a very dangerous environment. Mm. Mm. It's going to hard for you for 300, but if you just hold it low, it's going to be nibbing it all. There is one particular danger that the pilots have to be constantly aware of at low level. This is recent footage from the gun sight camera of a Hawk jet on a training sortie from RAF Valley. This indistinct smudge is a large bird of prey. It's about to hit them at 500 miles per hour. The bird punches a hole straight through the thick perspex canopy. The pilot was lucky to land safely. RAF Valley is sandwiched between a beach and a bird sanctuary. The risk of bird strikes is a real danger. Repairing aircraft hit by birds is a regular task for the engineers at RAF Valley. This Hawk jet was hit by a pigeon. It went straight through the aluminium casing. Patrolling the airfield is Dewey Thomas, Valley's bird control. He has two ways to scare the birds, with flares and with distress calls. Well, I'll put this one in for you, which is one of my favorites. <laughs> If a pilot reports a bird strike, it's Dewey's job to check it out. Um, we just heard on the radio now that there's a, a Tornado F3 inbound with a suspected bird strike. So this is where I start to jump into action a bit. We'll um, go and inspect it and have a quick chat with the air crew. Landed. It looked like it had a bird strike. Well, it's our Safos VK226. Um, well, from the side where we were looking at, um, I couldn't see any obvious signs, but um, we'll, we'll soon find out now. Anyway, we'll just go around the corner here and get to it. Okay. 
Did you actually? We didn't Sean see Barry anything. Cash, we felt the thump at high speed. And uh, visual inspection, nothing obvious. Nothing. Bird strikes cost the RAF over £20 million a year in repair costs. We've uh, had a good look around the aircraft. There's no visible sign of anything. Um, they've had a good sniff down the air intake as well, which apparently if a bird gets sucked into the engine, it smells like roast chicken from the back end of the engine. Uh, they reckon there's nothing there, so um, it looks as though it's going to be all right. But we'll make a note of it anyway, just in case uh, the engineers later on find something. It's Anglesey, it's spring, and the weather is unpredictable. It's crunch day for trainees Mark Baker, Rich Fawkes, and Dave McBride. Today they face their last hurdle at 208 Squadron, the final handling test. Beforehand, the pilots will fly what's called a pre-ride to iron out any problems. It's like a final lesson before your driving test. Well, I know that shouldn't happen, but if you fly through slipstream at low level, you could get some control difficulties, so try and avoid it in the first place. If you do, then make sure your aircraft is going up. If your aircraft is not going up in control, you only have one decision to make, which is get out of it. Dave flew his pre-ride yesterday, and it didn't go well. He wasn't allowed to take the test. Avoid it in the first place, and then we should have a problem. Now he has another chance. There's a seriousness about Dave today and a reluctance to talk. This is the culmination of six months hard graft at Valley and, if he fails, the end of his lifelong dream of becoming a fast jet pilot. As they get ready, Rich and Mark seem more relaxed. It's a big day for you, I guess. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, final handling test. That's the, the culmination of everything we learned here. Let's see if we can actually display it all in one trip. We've got the pre-ride to prove ourselves first. So, Mark, big day. Yes, got to be strong today. <laughs> Are you confident? Uh, yeah. Well, the pre-ride goes well, then. I feel better about the test, so one at a time. If I pass, that's going to be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, perfect finish, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just annoying that the weather's closing in. The weather's not great today. Uh, this is the best part of the day, the early morning. Um, it's deteriorating from the south, the, the clouds going to thicken up, and the visibility at low level is OK, um, so hopefully they'll get a little bit of that in. Um, the medium level is going to be a bit tricky for them. There's not much of a horizon out there, so it's going to be like flying around a goldfish bowl, um, so they've got to be careful there. Um, but again, it's, it's interesting for the, the tester in the back seat because he's looking to see whether the, um, the guy or the girl in the front seat is, is making sensible, safe decisions. So at the end of the day, that's what we've just spent millions of pounds and uh, and many months training them to do. Dave is still on the flight line. He's been sitting for 25 minutes waiting for the test. There's a technical hitch. The frustration mounts as he watches Mark and Rich take off. Having failed this trip yesterday, the holdup couldn't have come at a worse time. There's a further 20 minutes delay before Dave is given the all clear to take off.
pilots spend an hour in the skies over North Wales going through all they've learnt. They need to find a target 20 miles west with just a stopwatch and compass to guide them. They tail chase at 500 miles per hour when the plane in front can go any direction at any time. And they fly in close formation with wingtips just a few meters apart. Him, yeah? It was far better than yesterday, so why couldn't it yesterday? I don't know. <laughs> but you're ready for the big test, yeah? I think so. There we go. The man has spoken. Yes. <laughs> well, sooner the better, thank you. By 10.30, Dave has had his debrief. The result was not what he expected. Got, got to the end of the end of the debrief and he started talking about 19 squadron and you know of course when you're there you know you're gonna have to work hard and you're doing this 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 you know da -da. and uh, I sat there now sort of half confused thinking it's a strange line of conversation at the end of the debrief um, and then he said so uh, with all that in mind uh, well done you've just passed your FHT <laughs> this is a bonus of doing the GH25 with a tester so that's it. he said that he said there was no point putting you through the stress of going and doing yeah. the test you've just passed. <laughs> Absolutely stunned. <laughs> so that's it, it's all over. The pressure has finished. Mark and Rich still have to fly the final test, but for them there's an added complication. I don't think we have a ground we need particularly low cloud, but the first stops of rain will probably arrive between 10 and 11 o'clock. Threatening rainstorms have swept in from the south. Conditions in Snowdonia are too rough, so the test is switched to Scotland. It means we have to come up with a new plan in about five minutes, <laughs> having just done the previous plan. It's not supposed to be easy. The military pilot has to get the aeroplane airborne and go and achieve the mission, whatever the weather and whatever the conditions. And these guys have got to show that quality and they won't fly this sortie successfully if they don't show those characteristics. So the final handling test today, um, in today's weather conditions, is quite a challenge for them. They have just half an hour to get the new maps, make new flight plans, and check out no-fly zones. An added hazard is the Queen, who's flying around that area in a helicopter. Time is tight. Dave McBride lends a helping hand. When they got here on their first trip, they walked out to the aeroplane, they climbed up the ladder, they sat in the aircraft and they closed the lid and they went flying. Today, in this sortie, they will stride out to the aircraft and they will strap it on their backs, go out and do the job. will be away from Valley for over an hour. Now every manoeuvre they practised this morning is tested in bad weather, unfamiliar surroundings, and with a flight plan that changes by the minute. Yeah, it did well. Marvelous. 
a happy so, chappy. Does that mean he's passed? <laughs> he's passed, yes, yeah. Oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. He's not going to listen to the debrief now. No. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Well done. Good trip. Thank you very much. Thanks. Success? Yes, very successful. Awful day. A lot of thinking to be done there, a lot of uh, reorganisation. Yeah, very well done. Very well done. It's absolutely brilliant, yeah. Well, very chuffed, yeah. It's quite sort of hard work at times, trying to work out exactly what was going on, what's going to happen. Yeah, I am pleased, definitely. Now that Mark, Rich and Dave have all passed the last hurdle on 208 Squadron, there are a number of formalities to go to through. Like drafts. Firstly, they pass the finishing post on the pilot's unofficial course board. Finish. Secondly, the course commanders meet and begin to work out where the pilots will go next. Look at the last one then. Mark. Mark Baker. Lastly, there's a trip to Farnborough. Pilots have to have their tolerance to G-force tested on a centrifuge. G-force is the extra gravitational pull that pilots feel when turning at high speed. The reason they're being put through all this is that Valley sends two students per course to finish their training at a NATO base in Canada. To qualify, they must be young, unmarried, and able to tolerate the HG. Rich Forks and Mark Baker are young and unmarried, but can they cope with the G? It's going to be fairly unpleasant. I think the worst bit's waiting in the room, actually, before your, your go. So I'm quite glad to get it. Go next. Excuse me. Camera's there, okay. meters there, um, that's about it. Okay, yep. let's go. Right, so then, you ready for six? Yep. Okay. Okay, 6G when you're ready, please. Stand by. Stand by, 6G. At high G, gravity pulls blood away from the brain. Normally, this would lead to blackout. Pilots are trained to prevent this by tensing their muscles, keeping blood in the upper body. Just try backing off a little bit with the muscle tension. At 6 G, Mark is asked to relax. If he's heading for blackout, he'll start to get tunnel vision. They need to assess his natural G tolerance before building the pressure up to eight. How was that then? Oh, that's very unpleasant. We have we aimed to please. <laughs> I did get a bit of sort of mistiness. Didn't really come from the sides, just all sort of went crazy. Yeah, that looked fairly uh, fairly leisurely from my uh, perspective. Obviously, your G tolerance is probably uh, slightly on the high side, which helps. All right, if we can set up eight then, please. Set up 8G, 15 seconds. If Mark can take HG for 10 seconds, he'll qualify for combat training in Canada. Mark has passed the Canada test, and he could stop now. But so far today, every pilot has been up to 9G. Mark can hardly refuse. Okay, I'll come and open the door. Oh. Not very nice. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, not recommended, I think. But um, useful, to, useful to do, I think. You went for it, the 9G. Yeah, I wanted to want to see what the limit was, really. I mean, I know we only have to do eight, but it's useful to know in your own tolerance how high you can get, so worth doing, probably. In hindsight, it was not very nice, so I probably wouldn't have done it if I'd known. We were recommending to the rest of them not to bother. <laughs> Next up for high G is Rich Forks. I'll, I'll do the same as the others, so 
go up to the nine, ten seconds if you Yeah, see if I can get it. <laughs> Should be good. How well you can take G depends on your body shape, and it's not always men who are best at it. Women also are much better at taking G because they've got a shorter distance between the heart and the head, generally. Women are usually better at sustaining G than men. If, if, if you're tall, thin, and can run 20 miles you know, without having any effect on you, then you're going to have an incredibly low. So if you're short fat, you're if you're short fat, you eat pies and like beer, then you know, <laughs> clearly you can sustain 9G, so uh, I'm quids in with that. Rich passed the 8G test and then goes for the 9. Go on, Rich. At a traditional ceremony called creaming and streaming, the pilots find out what the future holds for them. There are three possibilities. Weapons training at 19 Squadron, RAF Valley. Weapons training at a NATO base in Canada. Where they could be retrained as a Hawk instructor and teach at Valley. Congratulations. Yes. Dave gets what he wants, weapons training at 19 Squadron. Rich gets his wish, again, weapons training at 19 Squadron. Mark desperately wants to go to Canada. It's not good news. He's got instructor training. But it's only a wind-up by the instructors. Mark gets Canada. Obviously for my entire career so far it's been training at flying, just learning how to fly the aircraft and at 19 for the first time we're going to actually get to experience and be shown how good or bad we actually are at using the aircraft as a weapons platform and uh, seeing whether we can get the bombs on target and whether we can shoot the guys who are trying to shoot us. Next on Combat Pilot, Dave gets to grips with dogfighting and high G. As the pressure mounts, Rich's dream of becoming a fast jet pilot is in the balance. This week, the production team will be online answering your questions about the making of the programme at bbc.co.uk slash combat pilot.